I'm Sonia Hurt, and I'm the Dean of the College of Environment and Design, and thank you all for coming. Um, this is our very first signature lecture in the post-COVID world, if I dare say. Uh, and it's really wonderful to see people streaming uh, back in the chapel the way it used to be. So, and I know the weather is beautiful outside, and it's the end of March, and lots of things to do, so I really appreciate your time uh, coming here. But um, you're here for a very special treat. Uh, this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, at least in Athens, to hear Dr. Diane Davis, who is one of the world's foremost scholars on urbanization, urban conflicts, and conflict resolution, and urban inclusion and resilience. Her focus is on Latin America, but her projects are all over the world, and actually she already gave her talk um, about Mexico in Stephen Ramos's class uh, there. Uh, so now she's going to talk about um, uh, other subjects. Uh, prior to introducing Dr. Davis, I'd be remiss at my job if I don't brag a little bit about our college. Uh, for those of you who are outside the college, uh, we were officially established, uh, what is it now, 53 years ago. And this, by the way, is one of the lectures for the 50th anniversary. But we missed three years of life or two, so now we are recovering. Uh, the college is home to one of the oldest, now nearly 100 years old, programs and most prestigious and largest in landscape architecture in this country. And we also have um, esteemed programs in historic preservation, urban planning, and environmental ethics. Prior to COVID, as maybe our people know, but maybe if you're outside the college, you don't know, uh, the last time Design Intelligence uh, ran the, the ranking of landscape architecture programs, uh, our college was ranked number one as the college to hire a landscape architect from. So to ensure this very special visit, as most good things in life, there was a collaborative effort. Uh, so first of all, this is our annual AGER -E -E lecture. The firm, uh, one of the most important landscape architecture firms based in Atlanta, and I wanna thank Bob Hughes for coming. He's right here in case you missed it. I am the Hughes professor, mystery solved. Um, and also it's a lecture that is co-sponsored with the Department of Sociology. Dr. Davis actually, she teaches at the Graduate School of Design as you hear, but uh, initially she is trained in sociology. So I wanna thank the chairperson of uh, sociology, Dr. James Coverdale, and some of his faculty and students uh, are here as well. At the same time, this is, as I mentioned, the UGA signature lecture. So although they are not here, I want to thank the provost and the associate provost uh, for funding uh, the lecture partially. And now to the introduction. Dr. Davis is the Norton Professor of Regional Planning and Urbanism at Harvard University's Graduate School of Design. She is formerly the chair of the Department of Urban Planning and Design. Prior to moving to Harvard, she served as Associate Dean of the School of Architecture and Planning at MIT. Dr. Davis is the author of several books, which I won't read all the titles, I'll kind of just give you the shortcut, including Transforming Urban Transport, Oxford University Press, Cities and Sovereignty, Indiana Press, Discipline and Development, Cambridge University Press, which also won in 2005 the, the award for best book in political sociology. Um, other books include The Regular Armed Forces and Their Own Politics, also Cambridge University Press, and Mexico City in the 20th Century, Tem in the 20th century Temple Press, also with a Spanish translation. Her research has been funded by some of the most prestigious fellowships that one can get in this country and around the world, including the MacArthur, the Heinz Foundation, the Ford Foundation, the Social Science Research Council, the U.S. Institute for Peace, the Mellon Foundation, the Carnegie Corporation, and the Volvo Research and Educational Foundation. So I think we went, you've covered everything. I think that actually is true. Uh, Dr. Davis is the founder and curator of the Mexican Cities Initiative at Harvard University also the chair of the David Rockefeller Center's Faculty Committee on Mexico. She's a member of the Weather, Weatherhead Center for International Affairs, Executive Committee, and a contributing editor to the U.S. Library of Congress. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Diane Davis. Thank you. Uh, well, you're probably wondering like, what am I gonna talk about? Because like, I'm all over the map, obviously in this kind of background that you've shared. Sonia, thank you so much. 
hopefully they w I will be focusing down on something that's, that's of interest to all of you. Um, so good afternoon, and I want to thank the, the kind of all the sponsors, both the, the provost office, of course, my good friend and colleague, Dean Sonia Hurt, the uh, Hughes group, uh, and uh, it's my great pleasure to be here with you at the University of Georgia. I got a tour of the campus. I've already learned about so many of the first here. It's a, it's a great pleasure. I've actually never had an opportunity to be here, so. So today I'm here to talk about the challenge of making cities more just, equitable, and inclusive. Let me contextualize my perspective on this a bit before starting. Although I've taught in urban planning programs for more than 20 years, and I'm still in an urban planning program, and I'm currently in Wisconsin, a, a planning program in a design school, I approach this topic from my experience as a social scientist, in particular, one trained in sociology, which Sonia has mentioned. As such, my approach, as you will see shortly, builds on a call for thinking about cities through three lenses simultaneously a sociological lens, an urban planning lens, and an urban design lens. Furthermore, although I will start my remarks with a concern about US cities, much of my writing, researching, and teaching has been comparative. In addition to my focus on Latin America, I've conducted research on what are called in the literature conflict cities, or places with deeply ingrained tensions, fissures, and at times violence over who belongs in that city. My purpose today is to build on my sociological and comparative knowledge of such places and to use this knowledge as well as a range of sociological scholars and philosophical theorists to produce a potentially new way of thinking about American cities and how to make them more inclusive. Now doing this is not gonna be that difficult because the kinds of socio-spatial divisions and exclusions that are evident in quintessential conflict cities, such as Belfast, Johannesburg, Beirut, and Jerusalem, also appear in many cities around the world, including in the United States. To a great degree, they are related to questions of urban form and the impact of property values and developer decisions on city life. Yet far beyond the questions of class and housing market dynamics that operate or that separate populations while also disadvantaging low-income immigrant and minority groups, in recent years, struggles over inclusion in the United States have intensified, fueled by the emergence of rights-based claims. Such claims are advanced by citizens who've gathered in the streets to challenge historical patterns of systematic exclusion and oppression. And although struggles over who has the right to citizenship and who belongs have been at the heart of American life for centuries, according to the scholar Schusler, globalization and the normalization of ever more narrow nationalism may be intensifying struggles over belonging. Such concerns have not only been revealed in national political conflicts over whether to build a wall on the US-Mexico border, they also manifest in mobilizations such as the Black Lives Matter movement. For century, questions over who belongs to what public, with what rights, and what guarantees under the law have been addressed constitutionally in the United States and elsewhere, thus relegating the adjudication of rights, recognition, and distribution of justice typically to national level authorities. Even so, so many acts of citizenship which I would define in terms of political rights and responsibilities associated with belonging to a given political community are increasingly unfolding at the urban scale and in ways that may challenge national scales of sovereignty. This is precisely why scholars like Saskia Sasson have argued that it may be time to quote, I hear, I hear, I quote, imagine new territories at which state sovereignty can be fixed. Building on such possibilities, in my talk, I will privilege the terrain of the city as a critical point of departure for both analyzing and proactively responding to fundamental questions of belonging, rights, and justice. 
first through the lens of sovereignty and then with a focus on the public sphere. Again, I want to use these frameworks, sovereignty and the public sphere, to help urban planners and designers think about how to create more inclusive cities. Now, the rationale for doing this is twofold. First, for most citizens, the lived experience of injustice is decidedly local, as I was mentioning earlier, felt in everyday interactions that reveal citizenship in ways that do not always align with the national imaginary. Second, much of the civic activism against oppressive forces of exclusion based on identities is now taking place on city streets. Cities, furthermore, as I don't need to tell people, especially in the urban planning and sociology departments, not only host high degrees of diversity, that's almost the definition of a city, they are also sites where belief in a shared political community of equals is often frequently sought over, although it's really difficult to sustain. Today I will argue that the city is, a critical, is as critical as the nation in producing, revealing, and potentially mitigating extreme patterns of exclusion. This in turn means that the materiality of the urban experience should be the starting point for addressing contemporary conflicts over belonging. Building on recent writings by Sasha Constanza Chalk, who argues that design justice is a way of actively engaging with the world to align progressive visions and desires with everyday tensions, conflicting values, and physical and temporal constraints on action, that's her definition, I focus explicitly on interventions that strengthen an inclusive community of allegiance at the city level. The cosmopolitanism and diversity of cities lays the demographic foundation for a public sphere where citizens can engage with each other more tangibly than is possible at the national scale. Yet again, most cities' stark socio-spatial segregation patterns really belie or prevent that actualization, making clear that the promise of substantive inclusion remains unfulfilled. The question that concerns me here, and I think many of you, hopefully, is what can urban planners and designers do about this? Can cities be reconfigured in ways that might counter the excesses of discrimination, of discriminating nationalism and identity-based exclusion? How, in short, can we achieve what Jacques Derrida heralded in his classic treatise on cosmopolitanism, a city whose meaning or identity elevates itself above nation states to become a place of refuge, forgiveness, and freedom itself. To answer these questions, I'm going to be sharing evidence about the ways that transformations of the urban built environment might provide a material pathway for the formation of a more tolerant and inclusive public sphere. And I do so by reflecting and sharing with you my research, prior research, on spatial patterns and practices in conflict cities where struggles over racial, ethno-national, or religious exclusion have been in common, and those two cities that I'm going to draw evidence from are Jerusalem and Belfast. I then, at the very end of my lecture, try to apply so we can learn from what's been done and not done in those cities and try to raise some questions about how they could be applied to the United States. So in theoretical terms, terms I situate these empirical aims in the context of debates over publics and the public sphere and how a strengthening of bonds of allegiance at the scale of the city might produce a territorial rescaling of sovereignty arrangements historically monopolized by nation states. And I'm realizing as I'm looking at this text, I've made that point several times, so hopefully you've got the point that we're looking at scales of sovereignty re refocus on the city. Now, that is not a new idea. Since the Westphalian era, the theory and practice of citizenship and inclusion under the law have unfolded in tandem with a focus on national sovereignty, as some of these books are kind of trying to underscore, uh, in a process that the historical sociologist Charles Tilley, who I was fortunate enough to have worked with in my first tenure track job at the New School, demonstrated as emerging from conflict among cities, states, and empires. And I'm not even going to get started on Ukraine, but we can talk about that in the question and answer if you want to. But the research, this historical research, reminds us that cities have always been central to sovereignty, even national sovereignty. 
in no small part because they were where citizenship practices first emerged, thus contributing to the socio-political construction of shared identities that then were catapulted up to the national scale. So even today, questions, uh, concerns with the presence or absence of toleration and, inclus and inclusion at the scale of the city still focus on citizen, just like back we think about Max Weber writing about the city or about the origins of democracy in a way can owes to relationships, work and other forms of relationships at the scale of the city. So in my talk, I want to take this research one step further and introduce the notion of sovereignty, not just citizenship, as a starting point for addressing citizenship. Now, although definitions of sovereignty have varied historically, sovereignty fundamentally implies supreme authority within and over a given territory. At the scale of the city, this requires a focus on governance and not just citizenship. And I think for the planners, you might think about yourself as working in between the governance and the citizenship domain, that that's the continuum that I think helps me understand sovereignty. Uh, despite activist efforts, without interventions from municipal actors, so again, governance, governing authorities are as important as citizens in thinking about sovereignty and is also about inclusion, because without their efforts to transform spaces, urban spaces and policies in the face of demands from citizens, those mobilized citizens will have limited capacity to change the structural contours of the urban built environment or the, un, what they consider to be unequal treatment at the hands of local authorities. And although private sector af actors are often responsible for spatial interventions that transform the built environment, such as those generated by developers, even those projects cannot happen without the actions or inactions of local authorities responsible for advancing justice. So again, in order to hold all those developers accountable and respond to citizens, both authorities and citizens, and they may have private sector allies, must unite be, be, behind a shared agenda for the city. So again, as my earlier slide, those struggles have a long history in work of Manuel Castells and Max Weber. And this history is also a reminder that urban sovereignty built on shared ideals and commitments between local governing authorities and citizens is both possible and informed by government scaled down at the city where citizens are actually active. In conceptualizing sovereignty, urban sovereignty as a starting point for understanding an imagined community of allegiance, and I, the, an operative concept there, and I'm gonna come to that in a second, um, well, let me put this, yeah, city-states. This is just the point that city-states have always been central in thinking about democracy and responsiveness. But in conceptualizing urban sovereignty as a starting point for, uh, for looking at the city, I draw on the concept of the imagined community of, of allegiance, which is an idea that was introduced by Benedict Anderson, and I'll say a little something about that in a second. So in addition to Anderson, I build on work of Asha Mean and Nigel Thrift, as well as Warren Magnuson, who claim that progressive politics come from seeing like a city rather than seeing like a state. I also draw inspiration from political theorist Bonnie Honig's discussion of quote unquote public things defined as the material objects and physical spaces that hold the potential to produce a sense of shared identity which will enable citizens to act collectively in pursuit of inclusive democratic ideals. And I've thrown a lot of names out there for you. If anybody's interested in kind of looking at this argument, this is based on a chapter that's coming out of a book that MIT Press is putting out called Just Urban Design. But I also want to underscore that I really am seriously drawing from scholars from a wide variety of disciplines to think about the materiality of what our kind of a shared community of allegiance or sovereignty at the city scale and how to bring people together behind a common vision that's inclusive. So further complicating matters, again, is this notion of the imagined community of allegiance. I want to underscore Benedict Anderson's concept of imagined community, which was used, he wrote an amazing book about nationalism, and he described nationalism as being uh, strengthened by 
bonds of imagined community of allegiance across a larger territory, and he's, that book focused explicitly on, the pr on print. So how the kind of development of print communication allowed people in different towns all over a nation to feel like they were part of the same imagined community. I want to think about that at the scale of a city, because actually when we think about cities, so many of them are kind of like city-states. I mean, they're, they're large, they're diverse, they have some of those characteristics that nations might have had 150 years ago. Uh, so the kind of the notion, I like the notion of imagined community because it, it, it allows the promise of people thinking about who they are in relationship to the people around them. And the question would become, at what point can they imagine being a part of community where there are people not like them in that same community? And I think that that's what I think about as the promise of, of strengthening inclusion at the scale of the city. How can you imagine even somebody who you don't necessarily see every day in your neighborhood as part of the larger scale? So with these, those are the theoretical and analytical foundations, and I'm going to look a little bit more on the material conditions that made that possible. Um, I, in particular, ask whether certain spatial conditions will enable or constrain a shared imagined community of allegiance in urban spaces, and it will also say a little something about how urban planning principles and design practices and governance policies might be reconfigured to generate trust between residents and local authorities and thus produce this kind of shared allegiance, a sovereignty arrangement that's imbued with enough legitimacy to countervail against exclusion and injustice. Allegiance to equal justice ideals are tested when local authorities, including the police, and I'll be talking about them in a second, abuse their power to take on the role of determining who is allowed to be in what parts of the city. Uh, likewise, when urban planning officials restrict or monitor certain populations more than others through measures like zoning, affordable housing, location, or transportation servicing, even though those are all well-intentioned policies, if they're not thinking about how they divide rather than find kind of common elements, they create, also have, hold the potential to create fissures and exclusions among urban citizens assumed to have the same national rights and recognitions, and even legal rights, but in the everyday materiality of the city, they're experiencing different sets of things. So, um, I'm adding one more concept here. I've got so many of them going on, and one, of course, is the kind of shared imagined community, but I also wanted to kind of share the work of a very important sociologist, Jürgen Habermas, who talked about the public sphere, because I think this concept is a political concept, but it's also very legible to planners and designers. Because when we think about public spaces and public goods, the notion of the public sphere, which is intended to be a more sociological concept, is a very helpful one. And that's another set. And this, this quote is a little bit about the original work of um, Habermas in his book. Gosh, it was probably written in the 70s, I think. Uh, called the transformation of the public sphere. And he talked about modernization and how cities then became places where you have plazas, public spaces, people come together, and that was a part of citizenship and democracy and empowerment. So now, let me go to the conflict cities that I'm interested in. I should say that I, I've got Stephen here, so we ran into each other at MIT. But when I was at MIT, I started a project that was a, a joint relationship between the urban planning program where I was teaching and the political science department. So I haven't even brought too much of the political science in more of my work in sociology, but I do work in political sociology. And we brought two activists from Jerusalem to help us think about uh, peace. This was a long time ago, and it, obviously uh, we were not very successful in this project, but the point was that we were really trying to be creative and imagine what would it take to get, you know, some more um, consensus about Jerusalem, which is like that city itself is what's dividing the nations itself. And so I did a lot of work there on that project. We had a international design competition for ideas to imagine Jerusalem, what it would be like to imagine it 
20 years down the road back then, or actually it was 50 years down the road because we needed a long time schedule, but what kind of interventions would make this a just, inclusive, prosperous city? And then the idea would be that urban planners and designers would work backwards. That was a very ideal pie in the sky project, but it got me very much interested in complex cities and that's what I'm gonna share some of that material from. So, um, and like one of the, just the, this slide here, this, this is actually a photo of Beirut, which was also torn up by civil wars in the city itself, fighting over who should be there or not. And that was not just a city conflict, it was a regional conflict, etc. But I guess I wanted to say the counter to the, the place that we don't wanna be, whether it's in this country or anywhere else, and again, sorry to bring up the Ukraine, is about fragmented sovereignty. That people are cl making claims, different national claims or different identity claims on a particular place. So that's the slide. Um, so I also have, um, yeah, I mean, I've got too many quotes here, but this is also another theorist that, I, that, I, uh, that I'm very much drawn to, who thinks he's an, an architect, who actually says when you're building as an architect or thinking about architectural projects, you have to remember that the city is a spatial, that is a political project. So now to, to um, think a little bit more about Jerusalem, Belfast, Johannesburg on this slide, but I'm gonna be talking mostly about Jerusalem and Belfast. So these, these quintessential conflict cities um, have been produced, or like they're divided, and there's a lot of tensions because the conditions were produced, of course, by national states trying to claim those territories for their own agenda. But urban authorities in these cities, both in Belfast and at, well, in Jerusalem, um, supplanted some of these outcomes about division, about who gets to be where, divided cities, the earth, these are understood to be actually physically divided cities in a place like Jerusalem, there's actually a barrier. And, and Belfast, of course, was literally divided. There were places you could and couldn't go when you were either Catholic or Protestant, etc. So I, I think that we want, even though the, these conflicts were a part of national struggles, that there were often urban authorities complicit in these issues. And their actions enforce what some scholars have called, you know, the, the, the fragmented sovereignty that I'm talking about. And the, those measures, like following, and again, you, you understand why authorities do that. They get their money from the national state, they have their programs, et cetera. But they prevent the farm formation of any unity that might happen at the city, even when everybody in the city is not invested in the larger national struggle. I don't know if anybody saw the movie Belfast. I didn't see it yet, but I want to see it. But like there are real, it's a real struggle for everyday people living in a place where the kind of larger kind of efforts to claim and identify territory and spaces in the city. So, um, uh, in understanding, so I want to think a little bit more in this project about what were the elements of city form that were introduced in these cities that maybe got in the way of more unity across the different identity groups in these cities, and which of these two cities were more successful. So I, I wanted to say that in looking at the elements of city form, a uh, really important element is um, the kind of there are a series of infrastructure elements and policies that seem to emerge in these and other cities. So one um, would be obviously infrastructure and the barriers to mobility, and that plays a really important role. So infrastructures like transport systems are, re are routinely structured in, these, in the conflicts as I've looked at to disadvantage certain social, ethnic, or class groups by making free movement and mixing of residents more or less difficult, either by route design or by the financial metrics of fares. That the materiality of m mobility is, an, is used to guarantee or deny equal rights in the city is an observation not lost on writers of Jerusalem's relatively new right, light rail system or its public buses, um, the latter of which embodies the not so veiled political project. So for years, cities like Belfast, jo Johannesburg, and Jerusalem controlled certain populations by physically isolating them from other residents, often using tra transport infrastructure or displacement or bearing 
you know, tearing down things or even sometimes putting public parks in places where people lived and dividing neighborhoods. Um, but also in many of these places, they were looking at lethal, using lethal force to maintain s separations. And of course, the troubles in Ireland and we, everybody, I'm not gonna belabor the, the sad stories that we all know about places like uh, Jer Jerusalem and Yo Johann well, Johannesburg, Jerusalem, as well as Belfast. So, but the point I wanna make is that there were really kind of policy decisions about urban form that were behind what looked to be like larger political decisions and whether how much the, the planners and designers were really complicit in that is an open question, but the point is one needs to think a little bit about of the long-term implications of those types of infrastructural developments or even sending police into places when it kind of gets in the way of any possibility of people coming together. Um, so I, I would say that w these kind of combination of factors I mentioned ex suggest two broad categories of urban conditions that we would need to look at to understand the extent to which a shared imagined community of allegiance in a city is possible. One then focuses on the materialities, such as the spatial, infrastructural, and institutional conditions that separated groups and, and or subgroups and produced conflict within between, either within urban residents, between them and authorities. And a second focuses on what I call the discursive modalities or narrative framings about built on historical and cultural memories, as well as normative assumptions about who belongs and how social spatial inclusion is both imagined from below and recognized from above. In Jerusalem, for example, Invocations of history or religious justifications for physically dividing a city based on Christian, Muslim, or Jewish architectural iconography can be understood as further as fueling discursive modalities of exclusion. And I know you have a historic preservation program here. This is a huge struggle in our critical conservation historical preservation program. How do we think about the beauty and the importance and the meaning of these sites without necessarily marshalling them to continue to create divisions that maybe most of the population would like to move beyond. So in order to understand the possibilities for inclusive public sphere, we must examine not just the grounded material realities that enable or constrain subjective inclusion, but also the socially constructed and communicative means through which horizontal loyalties among city dwellers and, as, and vertical loyalties between them and local authorities might or might not emerge. And again, this is where kind of the design and sociology come together because some professions have more skills, do more reading about those communicative, let's say practices, community, I mean, we in planning look at community meetings, et cetera, but the, we often t we're work in community meetings that are like neighborhood based. So the opportunities of like having cross dialogue and those are maybe a little bit different. So we wanna again, think about both discourses and narratives, references, as well as the physical, the physicality of the city. Now, in most cities, discursive and material conditions are interconnected in ways that produce tensions over belonging. And it, that raises, of course, the question of maybe could you, ch how much can you do to change the discourse first? Because, you know, Transport systems, big sink of investment in a lot of money. You can't necessarily always change big infrastructural investments the way that maybe you can work on other programs. Obviously, one wants to think about how they work together, but for planners and designers, one wants to think about where is the scope for action and maybe where you want to head in the long term. So all these are kind of just the analytics for thinking about for uh, inclusion. Um, so, um, I, I wanna say something about the fact that we're in a city where residents have unequal access to those urban public goods. So again, as much as discourse is important, the, the materiality does have to be returned to always. And maybe you can't change your transport system, but let's say there are other urban public goods, schooling, healthcare, safety, where there may be more scope to kind of think about how do we distribute them so they don't kind of reinforce the differences, the spatial differences that reinforce or allow identity differences to fester and f flower both 
for, often for kind of producing tensions at, at the scale of the city. So again, I need not tell the planners in here if all areas are not equally serviced by governing authorities and planning institutions, and if the city's physical form precludes access for all, then legitimate rule and citizenship is questioned, at least by some of the people that don't have the public good that other people do. Also, cities need a wide array of spaces, and this is where I'm thinking a little bit more about urban design potential, possibly even landscape design, but a, a wide array of spaces to which all residents have open and equal access, no matter their identity, their class, their religion, their ethnicity. Those with those without those accesses are likely to kind of fester the fact that they're excluded from the public and the shared imagined community of allegiance. So again, and I, I, I'm very, uh, since I wrote that book on transportation that Sonia mentioned, I have become very much interested in the materiality of mobility and how that affects a larger political project of guaranteeing or denying equal rights to inhabitants of a city. And you know, I, I did some work a couple, a couple years ago, I was at a conference at Georgia Tech in Atlanta. I know there are struggles about kind of densifying the city and dealing with the transportation. And what I would like to suggest is people who have experts in the kind of mobility sector are in conversation with people also thinking about the types of spaces that are going to, it's not just enough to kind of tear down a highway or something like that. What are the way that we're going to reconfigure urban spaces or urban form in order to create more shared public goods? Um, a third point I wanted to make is cities seeking to foster shared allegiance between citizens and authorities need to project, and I'm now I'm talking about the governing authority, that, that kind of a commitment to inclusion, something that can be achieved through the narrative or symbolic construction of a shared identity realized through physical interventions intended to dismantle prior barriers to population mixing. So the question is, can, um, American cities learn something from the ways in which the kind of questions I'm asking or the, you know, the, the urgency of dealing with materiality as well as discursive kind of representations of inclusion. Can we see what has happened in some of the quintessential conflict cities and can we learn from them? And that's where I want to start first by talking about Jerusalem. Um, excuse me. No. I'm going to be talking about Belfast because that the rest of the slides are, are just about Belfast itself because for a, a variety of large, important political reasons, including negotiations with American politicians and European politicians, there has been an effort to move beyond conflict in Belfast, but it was a long and drawn out process in terms of political negotiations. But I've done a lot of work on the physical, the physicality of what's happened in the reconstructing the peace process and reconstructing new inclusive practices in the city itself. So that's why I'm gonna say a little, share a little bit more about Belfast, because I think it's a good city for comparison. So during the Troubles, Belfast was known to be a city suffering from the legacies of political violence, violence, residential segregation, and communities characterized by mutual fears and suspicion. And we could think about that for a lot of cities around the world, but Belfast is one of the few that had that serious kind of set of problems, but has been recognized as being successful in efforts to move beyond these past sectarian divisions. And I'm going to say a little bit about, you know, and this is just a very broad overview about what they've done in that city. So for one, the city has fostered community arts interventions and adopted neighborhood redevelopment strategies intended to, to redress the unequal treatment of its Catholic and Protestant populations, including a specialized focus on the role of public arts and use of shared, use of shared public spaces to pro promote social cohesion. It has also used urban planning protocols to reintegrate formerly segregated areas by reclaiming low rent spaces for community arts organizations and encouraging people to create, to share creative activities in a safe environment. That's a quote from one of the reports. Likewise, designers and planners 
have innovated new processes for engaging citizens collectively in the imagining of new urban spaces. So it's not just a community meeting and community participation, but actually thinking about what would these new community spaces, what would they would imagine to be the new community spaces that they were gonna share, almost in kind of a microcosm of the idea of imagining a new, new, new community of allegiance, but at the very local scale to bring different groups together that have been divided by transport and barriers and boundaries in these are some of the art projects I'm showing here. Well, the one on the left is in Belfast. The one on the right is in Jerusalem, which is, these are kind of protest designs on the barrier wall, but this barrier wall still stays. Whereas in Belfast, there was a kind of a tearing down of, of like any walls that weren't porous and a recreation of activities around the porosity of the neighborhoods. So I, one of the interesting, one of the most successful community uh, projects was a community visual mapping process intended to focus attention on the material effects of sectarian planning decisions of the past. So kind of both thinking about how decisions were made in the past and then using maps and mater the material of mapping to create a new, new urban form. And they did, central to that process was the kind of importance of integrating the traditional methodology of visual mapping with a tailored taxonomy of elements revealing former sites of the urban conflict. So rather than kind of pretending that the urban conflict wasn't there in all those years, that was part and parcel of the innovation around bringing people together to imagine new ways to use them, memorialize them, and, and recreate them so they would be open to all. Encouraging pr pr residents in particular, and this is really key to me, to focus their attention, it's kind of a very urban design approach, on the edges, the borders, the barriers, and the doors that had, weren't either open or closed, that didn't allow people to move in space. Uh, and uh, among other sight lines that would exploit, expose barriers and enable more social inclusion. And through those strategies, Belfast has become a lab for planners and de designers committed to dealing with sectarian conflict. So, um, of course, the resolution of Northern Ireland's uh, sovereignty battles was partially a consequence of negotiated peace process, so I don't want to be Pollyannish about this, and it's not just a bunch of urban designers that can have a few visual mapping, or, you know, exercises and overcome long-standing conflicts and tensions. I mean, I'm, I'm very clear about that. Uh, but I do think that it's important that the political commitments from the contesting parties to work jointly together in those new imaginary ex exercises to imagine the future, even at a small scale, uh, they would, without those types of kind of groundwork being done as larger political decisions are being made by governing authorities, without that kind of involving citizens, bitterness would have lingered and many of the design and planning practices would not have been possible. So I think it's also important to recognize that not all the planning design programs introduced in post-conflict Belfast have produced an, an unequivocally inclusive public sphere. And again, we have to be realists about this. Uh, because society has its own norms and it's very hard to change social attitudes. It may be sometimes easier to change a project or a, a, a street corner project than it is to really change the society. But again, I'm imploring all of us to think about what is the way to kind of make sure there's a dialogue or relationship between these two things. I wanted to say in the Belfast case, there were in the effort to secure resources to enable some of the urban changes that would reduce the sectarian divides, the authorities pro promoted new waterfront developments and new shopping precincts and invited tech-led industries. And those are really successful policies on one end in terms of like overcoming larger nationalist identities, but they also generated new class fissures and uneven spatial development. So even if you can get people to come together to talk about projects, it's, it's a constant, it's, it's a constant ongoing process of thinking about will that intervention create another fissure, et cetera. So, but observers in Belfast have suggested that such trade-offs may have been necessary in order to deal with the roots of the sectarian problem. So sometimes maybe you'll accept a little class division in order to kind of create maybe race or ethnic division or uh, unity or religious unity or vice versa. Because sometimes it's very hard to deal with all those problems. And I think this is a, pleasant, this is a lesson 
about um, the lesson, what I mean, the centrality of economics and peace building. So, you know, you need money to create these things, not just like visual mapping, but you can really have to restructure a city in order to create those shared spaces. And I often think about this as a lesson that should be not lost on planners and designers in Louisville and Baltimore and Newark and Kenosha and Portland and other economically, well, Portland's not economically depressed in the same way as Newark and Baltimore are, but they are depressed and challenged cities where there was a lot of kind of racial division, but there's also a big economic development project that could be part and parcel of moving forward. Um, so that, I, I don't know what's happened, but I think I've lost a couple of my slides, but that's all right. I have got another page and a half or so, and then we'll, I would look, love to hear some of your questions. So that last observation about the importance of kind of having resources to kind of rebuild new spaces, rather than having your resources to keep the old divided cities, spatially segregated cities, and putting them out in a mall or in the, in the kind of in the periphery, putting them in places where you can start more shared public experiences and public goods, et cetera. Um, I think that there's plenty of work to be done on that in, in American cities. So I do want to think, I would like to think that maybe we can learn from looking at, at these quintessential conflict cities or intractably divided places that we haven't looked at much in American urban planning because we still believe many of us in the notion of American exceptionalism and that we're very different than other places. But I do think that at the scale of the city, there are a lot of cities around the world that have those kind of spatial divisions. And I need not underscore to you all here that with not just with COVID and people are focusing a little bit more on who's and what spaces and what neighborhoods people are suffering health care is because health care problems because they're divide well not only in access to health care but like f immigrant families that live in tight quarters etc so there's a lot of ways in which we can rethink about the spatial form of the city to try to make sure that even in something like a pandemic or even in an economy where there's not a lot of jobs and even in places where it's hard to get investments to kind of build different public goods, that we can do some minor changes to think and constantly think about whether there is more of a shared experience living in the city itself. So I think in the American context, um, one way to start this process is to make room both literally and figuratively, and again, I don't know what happened to my slides, but that's all right, um, for urban protest and open but peaceful contestation. So America has a history of tensions and conflicts built on mutual hostility over differences that have fueled conflict between protesters and authorities. It's been around forever. It will continue to be around. But I want to say that all forms of protest don't have to have violence, and all forms of protest are not bad. I mean, rioting is, protest is not the same as rioting. And with, the, with protests being one of the most robust indicators of democratic citizenship and a vibrant public sphere. So designing and fostering welcoming spaces for peaceful demonstrations of citizenship, I think should be high on the agenda of cities, contributing to what Chantal Mouffe has called agonistic pluralism. Because you know what, city, there will always be differences in cities. So, and we will never create utopia. We will never have the money or the political wherewithal or the you know, resources to create utopia, but we can constantly struggle over the process as planners and designers, and we should be aware when we're not doing our job in the ways that citizens want and allow them to make claims on us that are not necessarily just claims that come through the voting box because planners and designers are not voted into office, although the people that hire them maybe are. So, I mean, I think that we want to think about the possibility that, that conversation in space, in public space, around public issues, is something that could help us think about a shared, imagined community at the scale of the city. Um, and I think that that proposition allows me to circle back to conflicts. Um, do I have more of these? Oh, yes, I do have a few more slides. So, it's, it's a, it's, well, here's my, Here's my uh, slide about rethinking urban form, trying to look for more inclusion rather than division, and here's my slide about protest. 
protecting spaces for embracing publicity, like what it means to be a public citizen in a, in a city itself. And again, to link back to the beginning, th that kind of be making claims about the city that we live in is almost mu is so much more natural than, than using city spaces to make claims about an abstract notion like the nation. I mean, really want people to talk about how they live every day in their cities. So in addition to, uh, to the design of spaces for protest and public deliberation, deliberation, I think we could pay some attention to the semiotics and symbols of exclusion that generate protest in the first place and undermine a shared imagined community at the scale of the city. And we walked around and saw some of the statues here, and I know there's old buildings, and every building has its history, but, and I don't even need to tell this audience that the controversy over Confederate monuments evoked painful memories of the last major sovereignty battle that the US fought was a civil war, but I do think that we can think about semiotics and public spaces that are, are come for a sit for that re re represent and reflect the city and how people see themselves in a city and maybe not the nation. That some of those could produce alternative narratives on identity and inclusion for um, for a city. So one significant challenge for planners and designers in the months and years to come will be to experiment with those alternative symbols and discourses and activities that unite residents around an urban identity more reflective of the present and the future as opposed to the past. American cities are replete with architectural forms that speak to a prior history in which certain voices were excluded. Alternative renderings of the urbanville environment that display the diverse realities of the city will go a long way in advancing the narrative and hopefully the material groundwork for a more inclusive public sphere. So let me conclude. I want to conclude by again repeating that I know that cities are inherently sites of conflict. And that may be, and I'm not the only one to know that that may be an inevitable aspect of development and change in urban settings. Even so, not all cities are alike. The question is whether contestation or claim making unfolds within an inclusive public sphere or whether it operates within context, physical context of exclusivity. exclusivity. In my remarks today, I've tried to suggest that despite the inevitable ex existence of tensions between communities of difference, which are in every city, or conflicts over the role of history and culture, in keeping these tensions alive, purposeful urban design and planning actions can help create spaces for coexistence. In today's increasingly urbanized world, such interventions may be as important as, a larger democratic, as our larger democratic processes if we want to strengthen the shared commitments among citizens, planners, designers, and governing authorities, and use those relationships to strive for building better cities. Thank you.